Hey guys, welcome to the Wonderful World of Remnant Radio. Today, I've got Mikael with us. We're going to be discussing the Word of Faith coming out of his doctoral dissertation, uh, and we're going to dive into it. It's going to be fun. A lot of great stuff uh, coming up. You guys stay tuned. You are watching the Remnant Radio, a crowd-funded show where we interview pastors, teachers, historians, and theologians from different churches and denominations. My name is Joshua Lewis, and this is my co-host, Michael Roundtree. Together, we want to help you break outside of your theological echo chambers. If you're interested in learning about history, theology, or the gifts of the Spirit, this is the show for you. Very excited about this show. Lots of questions arise when we start talking about the Word of Faith movement. It's difficult because the Word of Faith doesn't have like a creed. They don't have like a statement of faith. You can't just say, hey, these guys are Word of Faith because they believe these things because there's no statement. So then you kind of get into this group think of like, hey, these guys share stages with each other and, and they kind of say similar things. So some people say, well, that group's not Word of Faith. And then people inside of the Word of Faith kind of have their own lingo where they're saying, hey, if Hagen taught it, then it's Word of Faith. But if someone else didn't, you know, you can't source it to Hagen, then, then that's not Word of Faith. And it's a really difficult subject to dive into. And fortunately, we have the expert on the subject. Uh, I've enjoyed reading uh, his uh, uh, dissertation on the subject. It's in a book. I'll give him an opportunity to talk more about that. But before we do, before we dive in, I want to remind you uh, that Remnant Radio is entirely cloud funded. So if you want to support the channel, you can uh, support the channel. Top two links of this video, a one-time gift on PayPal or a reoccurring gift on Patreon. If you choose to give on Patreon as low as five bucks a month, you get access to extra content. Uh, and if you give on PayPal, you can give one time uh, of any amount. Without further ado, I want to introduce you to my co-host, my friend, my partner in crime. This is Michael Miller. Michael, how are you doing? What's up, dude? I'm doing good, man. I uh, just got, I was out in Southern Illinois doing a conference with Jack Deere this weekend. Um, and then glad to be back. Got to preach at my church last night. Things are going fantastic. Very excited about this interview. Uh, for that, we'll introduce you to our friends, friend, Mikael. Did I say it right? It's, yeah. it's Michael in Excellent. Swedish. So tell us a little bit about yourself. Tell us about your ministry. Uh, and thank you for coming on the show. Well, thank you guys for having me. And, you know, I've been enjoying watching your show and you do a great job. Well, so Michael Stenhammer, or Mikael Stenhammer in Swedish. So I'm a Swedish uh, pastor, missionary, theologian. I uh, grew up in a Lutheran church, which is the former state church in Sweden. My mom is a charismatic Lutheran priest, but I got involved in the Word of Faith movement as a teenager in the Swedish Word of Faith movement. And I got really hooked. I thought that this is the truth, the way, the truth and the life. And we got involved in, or I got involved in the mega church in, in Uppsala, Sweden, which was the Word of, Word of Life, uh, you know, Word of Faith church. And I got a call for ministry. I felt that I was called to go to Russia, as many people were called at the time. But I wanted to have some more theological training. And I realized that my pastor, Alf Ekman, did not get his stuff out of nowhere. He had been to Tulsa, Oklahoma. He had studied under Kenneth Hagen. So I was able to go. So while Kenneth Hagen Sr. was alive, I studied two years at Rayma Bible Training Center at the time, which is now Rayma Bible College. And I was just hooked. I, I took everything. This was the truth. This was the the, the real word of God. And I uh, then was called to go to Kenya in Africa to do a uh, I, I to serve in a Bible school or a school of ministry. So for three years, I was the dean of a word of faith school of ministry in a mega church in Mombasa, Kenya, just at the Indian Ocean coast. It's a huge church, twenty thousand people, six Sunday services, three thousand people in each, and I was you know, teaching the word of faith doctrines and everything. I was basically an echo of what I heard from my spiritual father, Kenneth Hagen. Then I moved back to Sweden and I got married and I had, had nothing to do basically. So what, what, you know, what, when you don't know what to do, you study theology. So I took a few courses more in theology. I started to learn New Testament Greek. And as I'm doing that, I started to realize that, hey, some things that I've been taught and that I've been teaching myself don't really add up with the, with the main kind of teachings that I have, you know, received and that I've been an echo of myself. So that set me on a journey. So this is a long introduction, but it set me on a journey to try to find out what, what's true and what's not. Pilot's question, what's truth? So that I do two masters and I now finished this PhD and that's why I'm here. So. Yeah. Well, tell us a little bit about that too. So you, you did, well, before I do that, you've got a YouTube channel, you've got a website. 
people are going to be able to watch this video and they're going to want to watch more after this because this is going to scratch the surface. A lot of times people hear uh, critiques of the Word of Faith movement or just even assessments of what the Word of Faith movement is. And it's often done by outsiders. And you've kind of got inside language, inside experience from the Word of Faith space. So for people who have been around that orbit and want to kind of learn more about your take, where would they go find that information before we kind of uh, uh, spin off onto some more background questions? Yeah, thank you. Yeah. No, so my, my heart is that I want to live by faith. I want to live by genuine, real biblical faith, right? So I, I'm, I'm very grateful for a lot of stuff I received, but I also see that there are issues, and we'll talk about them here, that needs to be sorted out. So I, I, I do a project called Liberating Faith. You find it on liberating.faith, liberating.faith, just that, that simple kind of address. And I do some YouTube videos. I'm trying to cheat and do some of that kind of stuff. And I write articles and I try to communicate uh, some of the stuff that I've been seeing myself in research and things that have helped me. So yeah, liberating.faith is the place or on YouTube, you can just Google. And my name is so difficult to spell. So liberating faith is probably easier. Okay, so you've got your personal experience with the Word of Faith movement. You've, you've, you've come up, you started reading some Greek uh, kind of assessing some passages that you were taught and hey, this this verse says this or means that and you're able to kind of look at original languages and you're going, okay, this doesn't quite add up. Maybe maybe just unpack a little bit of your journey a little bit more for us. You had mentioned on a phone call that you and I had had when I was in Asbury because this, this interview has been a long way coming. So for those of you who know that I went to Asbury, it's, it's been a couple months. So uh, you, you had mentioned that it wasn't really until you got into worldview studies that this began to make more sense to you. Can you maybe unpack some of the trajectory from you know, okay, from Greek to uh, understanding worldview studies. Yeah, thank you. Yeah, so w when I started to realize that, hey, wait a minute, not everything adds up, right? I mean, there are some some visions in the movement where people were taught things from Jesus or angels, and some of that does not fit the New Testament Greek. That that put me in a spin. I mean, basically, what's true? My wife also grew up in the movement, and so she's also wondering, like, what's true or not? So what I did is that I thought, hey, the way to sort this out is exegesis, right? New Testament interpretation, because that's the answer to everything. So I, I really got into that, trying to sort out the different interpretations, try to sort out the meanings of different texts that uh, Hagen and others were teaching. But still, even as, as I spent years doing that, I, I realized that, hey, I'm still in a sense, not capturing the frog or the butterfly. Somehow I'm not getting this thing. So, and I, I'm still feeling that I'm a bit stuck in, in, in patterns of, of thinking, in patterns of, of desire and action that I can't really put my finger on. So I, then I moved into systematic theology because of course, if exegesis won't cut it, New Testament or, you know, that kind of studies, then of course, you know, a, a systematic theological grid will work where you go into Bible doctrines. So I started to do, do that a lot and, and use that as a filter to somehow understand what is the word of faith and what is prosperity, healing faith. But somehow I still did not really capture it. So then I got into worldview studies. And, and for those of you who are familiar with N.T. Wright, I know he's been on your show. He, he does a lot of work with worldview. And as I started to study Wright, I started to feel like, hey, I'm getting a perspective, a dimension, which go deeper than exegesis necessarily and just the, the doctrinal studies that I've been making and doing. So using worldview was a fantastic way for me to get my eyes open. And you might wonder, okay, so what's worldview? Well, the basic definition is that kind of uh, fundamental perspective from which we see everything else in life and approach life from this fundamental perspective. So I, I, I realized, hey, if I approach the word of faith and my background as a worldview, I might discover things. And to me, I really did. So, so let me just do it by way of analogy, just for our audience who might not understand what worldview is. So we, we often talk about that as a way of filtering truth and making sense of the world around us. And so like a Western worldview typically will write off anything supernatural. So like if you get a sickness, we'd say it's, well, it's either one of two things, bacterial or viral, um, uh, or less common, some sort of amoeba. Um, 
And then if you were to go and if somebody was to get sick in, let's say, Africa, well, they might think they've been somebody being cursed by a witch doctor. And so uh, I guess what you what you're telling us is that when you started getting into worldview view studies, you weren't just trying to figure out things, uh, what a Western worldview is or what an Eastern worldview is, but rather what was the ancient uh, biblical worldview? What was the worldview of those at the time of Jesus? Is that accurate? And that's why you started studying anti rights worldview stuff? Right. That's how I began. And of course, that's what right works with. But I realized, hey, if I use a worldview as a filter to understand the word of faith, then I might see things that are a bit deeper, that lie below the surface. And somebody said very well, I think, between stimuli and reaction, there's a space. And worldview somehow works in that space in our lives. And we, I think if we're going to go into the deeper levels of theology, worldview is very, very helpful. And Wright, of course, works with a worldview model where he says all worldviews consist basically of a big story, a grand meta narrative or however you want to phrase it. So getting into that perspective of, of not just ideas, not just pixels, but a main story, a, a meta narrative that that to me was revolutionizing. And that, that's really helpful, even understanding, like you're saying, historical Christianity or any kind of. Uh, Christian movement is that kind of idea of having a, a story, which maybe is not always explicit, but it's implicit. It keeps the world together. That's interesting. And I want to hear more about worldview and how that relates to this subject. But there's a lot of people who come to the subject of word of faith as well. And we haven't really defined that term either. Um, and when they come to that subject, there are two reactions often that happen. We have one often that's raised in the word of faith or around the word of faith. Uh, and they see lots of fruit in that space. Um, and you have another group of people who are like, hey, uh, I'm coming to uh, <laughs> I'm coming to talk theology and punch heretics. And I'm all out of words for theology. You know, like they're just ready to fight and and, <laughs> and have a conversation. Sorry, I know Miller had to unmute his microphone just to laugh at that. Anyway, so <laughs> there are people who on both sides are extremely charged when it comes to the subject to defend their friends, their family and others on the other side that are like, I just want to fight somebody. When we're framing this discussion, how would you want to frame those within the word of faith? Um, in, instinctually, my, my desire is to say that there are lots of people within the word of faith movement that attend word of faith churches, saved, believers, Christian, just because they identify as word of faith doesn't make them damnable. I do see word of faith excesses. People have seen us on the show say, hey, there's this individual who's in the word of faith. He's declaring that, you know, we're God. We're as much God as Jesus is God. And these kinds of statements, that's clearly heresy. But I think declaring there's a the end good of COVID. wiggle room. Say, say again? Declaring the end of COVID perchance. Yeah, yeah, th those kinds of things, right? So, like, again, now that that's her heretical, it's just odd. Um, anyway, <laughs> there, it seems like there's a, a wide net of people who would identify as word of faith. Um, and there's some people within that that go, hey, that's not word of faith. That is word of faith. So could you, one, maybe define what word of faith is and then also frame it for us in our discussion? Like, how do you want to approach people who are in the word of faith camp? Are you like pro word of faith? Are you anti word of faith? Like, just how do we how do we posture our heart even for this conversation? Yeah, well, that, I think that's an awesome question. Uh, when, it, when it comes to word of faith and the discussion, I think you, you frame it so well because we're having a very polarized discussion, right? We have people who on one side are saying this is God's ultimate truth. These truths are revealed directly from heaven through revelation knowledge. And then we have another group who say, no, this is another gospel. This is another Jesus. This is definitely heresy. And these people are not, I mean, ex at least the main leaders are not even saved. They are even demon possessed. And I mean, we have these polarized knowledge, polarized positions and the discussions have, you know, somehow generated more heat than light. And it's, it's kind of problematic. And, and to me, I found a, very interesting, helpful approach to me is that if you take the, the prodigal son for as an image here, just because somebody acts as a prodigal son doesn't mean that we automatically have to act like the older son in the parable. So even if we spot excesses and extremes in some areas, that doesn't mean automatically that we have to have a knee jerk reaction and just call, oh, well, they're heretics because there are some issues involved here that are not straightforward or not even biblical. So I think, like you're saying, I think we need to have a wider perspective. I, need, I think we need to approach this with a, a good sense of love and a good, a good measure of humility. Because I think what has happened also is that the word of faith 
they they raise questions that traditional Christianity has stayed away from. So, but by by approaching this, I, I found a very helpful approach to me, and that is to what to look at the word of faith as actually raising extremely important questions for us. Their ans- when they answer their own questions, that might be a problem because often some of their answers are off, and they they you know they need help in that. But the questions they raise are, are quite good, and they kind of you know will will help our faith grow stronger as well. So I think it's a mix. It's complex, and, and these kind of fast answers are not really helpful. Yeah, could you maybe define the word of faith for us um, as as we're going to be working through the worldview of the word of faith? Yeah, thank you. Well, it's that's not very easy <laughs> because I mean here again, like you were saying in the introduction, we have a movement that doesn't really have any statement of faith. They usually just go under neo charismatic or non denominational. Uh, we don't have any specific leader that has written a theological statement or statements of faith. If you go to word of faith churches, usually they have almost an AG statement of faith or something similar. So it's very difficult just to define them doctrinally. But a, a, a common way of defining it is like it's a movement uh, that, that focuses on health and, and financial prosperity and success in life as rights, as privileges, as uh, not just privileges, but as, as Christian rights, as entitlements that you have to claim by faith. And this faith is expressed in two ways. It's through positive speaking, confessions, declarations. You have many names for it, but also by sowing financial seeds. So that's a main definition that is used by Lausanne movement. And many scholars adopt that definition. And I think it's quite helpful. Okay, excellent. Well, I think the next question that we'd have to ask is on the subject of worldview in framing these discussions. Uh, can you explain the different models that have been used and that you use in your dissertation, uh, like the like the, the the doctrinal model, the biblical model, the historical model, the, the socioeconomic model? Can you maybe walk through some of those models and in, in trying to understand what the word of faith is, how to define it, that kind of thing? Could you maybe walk us through some of that so people can familiarize them, themselves with some of your work? Yeah. All right. Thank you. Well, so getting into academic research on the word of faith is like entering a jungle. Uh, when I started my research, it was like, hey, what's going on? I thought I was going to do a research and, and a dissertation on the worldview of the word of faith movement, realizing that, hey, Pentecostalism is difficult to, to define. Word of faith is even more difficult to define. And then getting into the scholarly discussions on the word of faith, it was like a jungle. There were no fixed points. And, and like I was saying, it's very polarized. So uh, I spent, well, almost a year going through the different researches and trying to find, are there different ways of, of understanding the word of faith? And how does the scholarly community and, and theologians try to explain and understand the word of faith? And I, I spotted a couple of models that are used and and if you're a bit familiar with the discussions among uh, you know around the word of faith you will recognize these but the first one and this is in historical kind of progression the first model that came as as the word of faith arose in the 60s and 70s the first kind of model to understand the word of faith is what i call a doctrinal model and it, and it's based on the idea that this movement must be you know, at, at the very center, some kind of doctrines in it. So uh, a doctrinal model says, hey, the word of faith is based on doctrines and let's let's kind of capture those doctrines and analyze them. So they, they pick a few key doctrines. And of course, it's not that easy because, I mean, the material that are there are usually sermons and teachings and not any doctrinal kind of statements. But they, they pick some of these like prosperity or healing, faith. Uh, revelation knowledge, some of those doctrines, and of course, the doctrine of Jesus or Christology, some of those doctrines were picked and people analyzed them and tried to to kind of compare them to uh, other doctrines that we have or other statements. And at that time, uh, of course, the word of faith looked very strange because we, scholars usually just picked some of the main new doctrines that they were teaching and comparing them to scholars within other evangelical Pentecostal traditions. And that the comparison ended up saying, hey, there's a lot of new content here. That means if it's new, it cannot be true. So heresy, usually that's how the doctrine model worked in the beginning. 
where we tried where scholars just try to understand the doctrines but of course it's also very helpful because these scholars helped us to see what are the main doctrinal points what you know help us to compare so moving on from there another model that was used or still used is the biblical model where you start to look at uh you know what are the key scriptures used how are they interpreted uh do the interpretations hold water are they i mean do they do the biblical text justice and that kind of stuff and also looking at the hermeneutics or the principles of interpretation are are the way the word of faith preachers interpreting the bible is that according to received evangelical pentecostal you know hermeneutics or principles of interpretation and at that point word of faith received and still receive a lot of criticism that word of faith is involved not in exegesis of drawing meaning out of the text but asegesis of reading meaning into the text and scholars are saying that hey there is a certain kind of interpretation or hermeneutic called what they call a contractual hermeneutic that word of faith people read the bible as a contract and and that defines everything else and there's a lot of things going on in the biblical model it's helpful it's very helpful but still there i think they uh talking about worldview it still doesn't reach that level of, of the biblical story of something that holds together more widely so the biblical model is helpful but doesn't go deep enough i think even the doctrinal model so what happened and a discussion that had kept on in, in in scholarly circles was that let's look at the historical roots because if you if you can locate the historical roots of the word of faith surely you can know if it's orthodox or classical christian or not and this is where a lot of energy has been spent is trying to show that there is a direct link between kenneth hagan and non-Christian philosophy called New Thought, for example, or basically New Age. Well, you can understand it that way. So the idea was that Hagen, he copied a man called E.W. Kenyon, and E.W. Kenyon had incorporated a lot of New Thought philosophy. This thesis goes, right? So because of Hagen copying Kenyon, who copied New Thought, what Hagen teaches is not Christian. It's unorthodox and well so the historical roots in a sense prove that the word of faith is a is a different gospel and another jesus so that that's somehow the historical approach or historical lens there are other scholars who of course oppose that and say hey if you look at it you will find that kenneth hagan uh kind of used and and the rhetoric of new new thought but he incorporated much more evangelically or pentecostally in a sense so that 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 Kenyan connection between New Thought, Kenyan and Hagen might not be as straightforward as some people have said it is. So here the discussion continues and there are good people who do work here trying to show the complexity of the historical roots and we might get back to that. And the last one that is kind of an explosion among uh, word of faith scholarship in the world now is the what I call the socioeconomic model. It's not theologically interested. It's more. It's a model that looks more at the the drawing from anthropology, the study of humanity or humans and stuff, and interactions, and then looking at sociology and economics, and using those as filters to understand what is going on in the world of faith. And I don't need to get into the complexity of that, but there are some really interesting things coming up by using those lenses. And one example I can just give one example is that word of faith has been very attractive to to poor people and marginalized people in the global south in africa for example you've got massive word of faith churches and people give out of a promise to get wealthy but they many do not get wealthy but they still give and this has puzzled scholars right and, and theologians have really pulled their hair and their beards wondering like hey what's you know what's going on how can poor people give their hard-earned money uh, to a rich preacher and they still don't get those promises fulfilled. And then anthropologists and sociologists have come up with a very interesting explanation. And they're saying that, hey, by entering gift giving, you are entering a deeper set of relationship. And it turns you also from being a receiver to being a giver. And that is empowering. 
So even if you don't get a financial reward, you might get a personal reward of feeling empowered, of, of taking a step away from just being a poor person on the receiving end to actually becoming a giver. And in that sense, what a faith is empowering. So that, that's some interesting insights from this socioeconomic model. And there's a lot to talk about there, but I, I leave it at that. So those are basically four different models that are used uh, mainly within scholarship. And th this is interesting to me because there's a, a gentleman online, he's a word of faith apologist, uh, or, or so he calls himself. Um, and uh, it's, it's interesting because it makes sense the way that you're articulating uh, the different approaches to word of faith scholarship. I think he might take the historical model, um, though he's trying to defend word of faith. He'll go, hey, if Kenyon didn't t teach it, and he'll, he'll, he'll say, hey, he didn't, he didn't learn this stuff from Kenyon. Hagen, Hagen got this stuff on his own. He got this from this, this place in scripture, and, and he, they didn't pull from New Age thought, right? And maybe he, he quoted Kenyon, maybe he pulled some stuff from Kenyon, but it doesn't necessarily come from you know, this uh, you know, speaking things into existence. Like th this is more of a, of a faith thing, a Bible thing. These are where our roots are. And, and what's really interesting is that people will try to do the biblical or the theological, and then he'll go, no, it's rooted in, in this history of this teaching of this guy. And it's interesting because, I mean, to your point, if I was to be a word of faith guy, and maybe this is a challenge for you guys out there, if you're out there and you're listening and you're a word of faith person and you're, you're going, hey, what he just said doesn't sound like word of faith to me, what I will charge you to do, please, for the love of all that is good and holy, please do this. Make a statement of faith and get all of the word of faith churches to jump on board and sign it and say, we are this and not that, because it will clear up the conversation for all of us. Like we, we're, 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 we're hanging out in this like, amorphous blob where, you know, there are all these mainline preachers saying, I am word of faith. And then you have groups of people who are defending Hagen going, they're not word of faith. And it's like, look, who am I supposed to believe? Wh whose definition am I supposed to take? Your YouTube channel's definition or hundreds of millions of viewers here on this massive platform over here? It just, it would clean up all of the conversation for us if someone would go out and say, hey, this is our statement. Uh, anyway, so that's my charge to all the people who are word of faith that are listening, you know, be blessed with that. And I think it would create unity in your movement. It would create it would create clear distinctions so we know what you believe and what you don't believe. It would be a good thing. Anyway, I digress. Miller, I, I've taken over a couple of questions back to back. I'll, I'll toss it over to you. No, no, it's fine. I'm, I'm, I'm glad he's kind of explaining the different models to that are available to assess what word of faith is. I guess I'm curious to know what you think your strongest model is. And it seems like it was worldview. Is that right? To explain a to discovering a meta narrative uh, and sort of framing the word of faith within the meta narrative of scripture. Is that right? Or N.T. Wright's meta narrative? Yeah. So uh, these are the main models of, of scholarship, right? And still we had these heated discussion, you know, is this a, you know, uh, the, the book of Acts, a, you know, church that is just full of truth, or is this a heresy? And people are pulling from these different models left and right. And I felt even myself as trying to work through my heritage, my word of faith heritage and, and background, that some of these models, they were wonderful, but they were still limiting. Uh, they were, they, they really didn't get me to the point where I could really capture again, the, the butterfly or the frog, depending on what perspective you come from. So uh, that's when I got into worldview. And worldview, of course, like I mentioned, brings you to, tries at least to bring you to a step deeper and say, there is a meta narrative. There is a story within the word of faith. There's a story that, that within it, that these different doctrinal standpoints actually make sense. And it makes sense for a preacher to drive a brand new Mercedes Benz within the slum of Nairobi, for example. It just makes sense. And it makes sense for people to, to give to, you know, to, like I said, poor, you know, poor people giving to rich preachers. It makes sense. And there is that kind of story. So what I so set out to try to find is, is there a meta narrative? Is there a, a, a complete story within the Word of Faith movement that maybe they themselves are not written out, but it's, it's a lived story. You find it through practices or you find it implicit in different ways. So yeah, so I, I kind of suggest a, a fifth model. I'm not alone in using those dimensions, but I'm, I, I kind of made my thesis about that, saying that if you use a, a, another model, worldview, we can incorporate the benefits from all these different other perspectives, but perhaps we could add something a bit wider and deeper. So what is the definitive worldview of Word of Faith? Yeah, thank you. 
uh, I spent four years writing and, and, and doing stuff and still wrestling with it. So I think because word of faith is, it's alive, right? It's, it's a, uh, whatever you want to call it, a movement or whatever, it's alive. So it's trying to capture a bird in its flight. So, and like Heraclitus said, right, you cannot step into the, the same river twice. So you're trying to define a living thing. So I think that that demands a, a bit of humility in the in those who who study it. I don't know if I reach that level of humility, but at least I try to and try to see that hey, we cannot just you know we, we have to have a sense of humility in a, in a living movement. It, it's moving, it's changing. But yeah, so what is the definition? Well, I find that it's very difficult again to give two or three lines, two or three you know short definitions. I found it very helpful to go into the story level to say that. If we start to look at the, the meta narrative, the theological story that defines the movement, somehow there we can start to find unity, who, who, who unites in this story uh, and who will not be part of it. So I, I'll say that going into that story level is, is, is the best way, at least for me, to try to grasp what the word of faith is. You, you mentioned in your book that there this story, uh, you, you kind of define it as the plot of Adam or uh, the, the, the Adam plot, right? And they have these sequences um, that kind of define the story, the theology, the ethos of what word of faith is. You talked about Eden, you talked about the fall, redemption, the church and heaven as kind of being the five major sequences within this one plot of, of the storyline of Adam. Could you maybe unpack some of that for us. I, I'm, I'm interested as well because we're talking about um, we're talking about this movement and about worldview. And because this movement hasn't been doctrinally defined, um, we've seen like word of faith theology like just affect the vast, I say the vast majority, much of the Western and, and its theology. Michael Miller came and spoke at my church uh, just what, last, not last week, but the week before. And, and he was just, you know, uh, kind of explaining what faith is in regards to the view that some have in the word of faith of what faith is. And it was shocking that people that have been going to our church, they're like, oh yeah, yeah, I have been holding this view of faith that might might be inconsistent with scripture. So so uh, first let's let's have you un unpack this, the, the plot of Adam, if you will, uh, going through these five sequences. But even, uh, even with that in mind, I wanna kind of take, put a pin in that in a moment and kind of circle back around to how the word of faith is uh, affected and, and, and contributed to, influenced uh, the kind of worldview of Christianity in the West. So uh, some of that to look forward to for people who are staying tuned. Yeah, great. I want great stuff. Well, I, I, I'll begin like saying that what, what to me it was revolutionizing to see that there is a short plot, not a full complete story, but there's a plot uh, ex explicitly found in Hagen and many of these word of faith uh, key personalities. And not just in the US, you find them in Africa, you find them in Asia, even in Europe. Uh, those who somehow have orbited around Hagen have picked up a certain plot in the way they understand the biblical story. So it's, it is the biblical story, but it's a unique take on the biblical story that I'm kind of after and that I, I see as defining the, the unique identity of the word of faith. And so what you find is that I call it the Adam plot and it's very simple. And, and for those within the word of faith, they will not think this is anything new under the sun because this is what you grew up with. And the idea is that God created Adam in his, in his own level. That, that Adam shared uh, God's DNA, all right? And so Adam is that creating this high position in Eden. And then Adam shared God's faith. So God created the world by speaking. And because Adam is created uh, in God's direct image and likeness, partaking of his very nature, Adam can also use God's faith to create, the, to create with his words like God. And Adam was put in Eden, which was a place of prosperity and health, divine health, with a mandate to rule the world. Not just the world, but also spiritual authority. So authority is a key point here, that Adam was given this authority, this dom dominion over the world, even the spiritual realm. So Adam could even command angels, all right? So Adam had this position of authority in the world, and God had given him a lease 
on the earth. And some will even give the, the, the length of this lease, but let's leave that for a moment. But anyway, the idea is that Adam is created in, in, God's, in God's class of beings. That's how Hagen expresses it and others. Now, when Adam committed high treason, the story goes, Adam gave this dominion, this right to rule the world, he gave it over to Satan. And he lost the image of God in himself. And radical word of faith people, what Kate Bowler called the, the hard type prosperity, they will say that even Adam lost and got satanic nature. And here you go, the spin off into Jesus dying spiritually and stuff. And I, we don't have to get into that now, but still within this Adam plot, that's the main structure. That, so Adam was created in, in God's image and likeness and even sharing equality with God, having this dominion, this authority and using faith as a tool to rule the, the world and expand in a sense and increase. And here, we're, this is where prosperity comes in. And he had divine life and health so when adam sinned he lost all this all right so he he became a child of the devil and satan became literally the god of this world and so that's kind of the main problem now so satan is ruling the world with adam's lost ruling authority and adam has lost his uh image his image uh, of god and his likeness with god and he's a slave of satan that's why God entered a covenant with Abraham and so on, because God somehow needed a way to access the earth and bring Adam back to his position of authority. And that's why Jesus came. So Jesus came to restore Adam to this position of authority or, or believers that is now, right? So Jesus came to restore the ruling authority to believers. So anyone now who uh, receives Jesus is now back in Eden. So it's like Eden redeemed. So now if you're a believer in Jesus, you're back to Adam's position of authority. You have access to God's faith. You, you have access to prosperity. Health again is now a right as it was in Eden. And the only thing that keeps us from living in the reality of Eden is our lack of knowledge. We just don't know that this is what Jesus has done for us. So, and our kind of fallen nature is exchanged with God's nature again, and we can command angels and stuff. And so word of faith puts the believer back in Eden and in their particular interpretation of Eden. So that, that's basically it. And, and this will also explain a bit why Jesus is rich, because he came in, uh, in the word of faith interpretation, Jesus came living out the same realities as Adam. So he, he, that's why Jesus was rich. He, 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 in the word of faith interpretation of things. So he came with all these riches and he used faith. Jesus used the power of faith and all this kind of stuff to bring Adam back, to bring the authority back to humanity. And this is where we are now. So word of faith places us, the church, in this age where everything has been given. God has done everything for our blessing. God has restored everything. Everything has been done. It's not up to me to do something. And faith is that power that, that you know, materializes and makes these things real. So the, the impetus for action or the, the motivation for action or whatever is on me as the believer, because God has already done everything. Everything is all blessings, health, prosperity, success is available in the spiritual realm. And faith is that power that grabs hold of it and brings us into reality. So, so that, that's kind of the word of faith story in a nutshell. And then, of course, we all go to heaven when Jesus comes back. So the, the key here in the, in the meta narrative is where, and sorry, this is where I would say I probably diverge. Um, but it's, it's right there at the beginning with Adam and how you define faith and how you define um, what it means for Adam to be made in the image of God. In, and in the case of the word of faith, if I was to phrase it this way, would this be accurate? Um, they believe the word of faith movement believes that Adam had the faith of God, not necessarily faith in God, um, faith of God. And, and they would again define faith as this believing in your words to shape the world around you so that you can create like God created the earth as well. Was that accurate? Yeah. 
Well, it's very accurate. I mean, for me, it was revolutionizing. I, when I, when I, like I said, when I did New Testament Greek, I had a very wonderful Greek teacher. He was like the velvet hammer. So he, he was very kind and gave very hard assignments. And one of them was for me to learn the Gospel of John, to be able to, inter to translate it orally without any books or helps, anything. So I, you know, dived into the Gospel of John. And I'm still within my word of faith worldview. I, I thought I had left it doctrinally, but I'm in something. And as I'm wrestling with the Gospel of John, I see something. I have this Hebrica moment, right? Uh, uh, moment where I, I don't run naked in the streets, but I just see something. And, Not and yet. It, I word see of faith may that, change that, though. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> yeah, you know. And and what I see is that it, John, when he writes <laughs> pistevo or believing or faith. He, he always has an object, or not always, but he is pushing having an object there, which is God. And that brought me into seeing what you actually said right there, is that faith within the word of faith is often not faith in God, but faith of God. And of course, it yeah. comes from the reading of Mark 11, and we don't have to get into that now. But yeah, absolutely, but it, that faith but it's, becomes something in and of itself. And to me, it was revolutionizing to realize, hey, biblical faith is actually a relational entity it's not power so i wrote an article and i did a small youtube clip where i say faith has no secret ingredient because to me it was revolutionizing to realize that faith is faith in god it's trust in god right and it's that relational entity and and it, it's a categorical mistake to say that faith is a force faith is a power faith is an instrument because it exists in a relationship it would be as foolish so, as you know me walking around saying i have such a strong relationship and you know here are 10 principles of my relationship and here are three keys to a powerful relationship and my relationship is so strong and finally you would probably ask with whom do you have this relationship and i would say no i don't have it with anybody i just have this relationship i mean it doesn't make sense and the same thing is with faith faith is what happens Well, that's unfortunate. Yeah. Uh, did we just lose this connection? Faith is what? Okay, I lost you. you. You froze on me. You said faith is what happens when, and then you just froze. And then my he spoke. Eye. That, Go, that was the purpose. That, it, okay. that was not the connection. That was me giving a cliffhanger. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> I was very, very convincing. Well, hey, hold hold on a second. Um, I just I want to go back here for a second because this is uh, my claim has been that the word of faith has snuck into a, almost every form of charismatic Christianity. Like you find it in almost every charismatic, or or I would say continuationist church, where its impact is there, and it largely boils down to this: seeing faith as a metaphysical force rather than seeing faith as a trust in a person yeah, or fidelity in a person. Yeah, I agree. And this is where, for, to me, uh, the difference between worldview and movement really helped or ethos and movement. I mean, that the, the movement is kind of to itself, right? But th some of these things have taken, taken off and really affected a big part. So, yeah, I definitely agree with you. And, and this conception of faith has been extremely influential. Uh, the idea of faith being something in and of itself. And it's a categorical mistake. It's like saying number four is green. Uh, I mean, it just doesn't, it doesn't work, but it's still there. It's very powerful and it's very influential. So the, the word faith as it's used in the word of faith is a categorical mistake. Yeah, so now this is the complexity of stuff. If we just take a few set things that they're saying out of context, I mean, out of the big context, you will say that faith in the word of faith is a force and a power. And because that's not biblical, the whole movement is unbiblical. But if you listen in very carefully and, and that when you listen to them, sometimes in the same sentence, they can use two definitions of faith. They definitely speak about faith as trust, as personal trust. I have a good quote of Creflo Dollar. So it's both say and. Exactly. It's a mix. It's a, it, that's why it makes it complicated because sometimes they really have good teachings on faith as trust in God. And at other times it is faith as a force or a power. And so it, that's why I think people who so, come from more traditional Christian backgrounds, when they listen to the word of faith, they, they filter it through a more sound narrative. So they end up be, being encouraged in their personal trust in God through word of faith teachings. But that's not necessarily what they're saying, because at, at sometimes, of course, it's faith as a force. 
But even within Hagen, you find him mixing these categories of faith as faith in God and faith as faith of God. And then you actually have a third, which is faith in the word of God, which takes another kind of shape. But we can stay with faith in and of God. Oh, gosh, yeah. I think uh, it would be a lot of fun to just go through questions or of this. Like, um, here's a statement made by, and then we don't have to name the name, but just simply tell me, word of faith or faith as relationship? Yeah. Like, uh, faith is the currency of heaven. Where would that fit? Yeah. Are you, well, I'll leave it to the to you, to your viewers to decide that because that's a great stuff. That, 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 I mean, that's a great stuff, and I think that's when it comes down to pra, you know the practical stuff. I mean, we you know we shouldn't turn our heads off when we hear people speak about faith, but we should listen in. You know, where does this come from? In what story? I mean, what story now empowers this word faith that is used? Is it the biblical story or is it the Adam plot story, right? I mean, that, that, that I think is very, very helpful. Yeah, you also, in your book, you mentioned how um, the word of faith, you, you mentioned faith a lot, right? We talked about that a little bit just now about, you know, these your words are these containers that use the force of faith and we can control this, this force. Um, and there are problems with that. No, man, I, I want to get into uh, sowing and reaping and some of the law stuff, but I feel like we have to go back into some of the uh, some of the the Adam story that we were talking about just a moment ago, because we we not only we 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 have a rich history um, in Christian tradition of a doctrine called theosis, um, this idea of partaking of divine nature, right? Of of taking on the essence, but but making sure that the the essence and energies and the natures and essence language are distinct within our conversations, uh, and which is an important distinction because it creates a distinction between the creator and the creation. And it sounds like the anthropology of the word of faith system makes man equal to God in his ontology rather than allowing him to have access to divine nature by grace. And the reason I'm bringing this up again is because I feel like um, we have to have a talk about faith. We have to talk about the contractional stuff. And then we have to have a conversation about grace and how grace works into all of that. So I feel like we have to bring up this Adam thing again. Can you maybe unpack? Because again, there seems to be a little bit of truth. <laughs> we, we, say, we say it this way in, in the South, a little bit of poop in the brownie. It, there does seem to be just a, enough just not orthodox stuff in that that it makes it that makes it bad but there does seem to be truth in it as well right like adam was created in the garden adam did seem to have authority over the earth in some real sense and he seemed to give that authority over to satan so when you're giving this narrative of the way that the world works it's not that all of it is wrong but it, but it is that there are enough pieces of it wrong uh, that it's like if you if you change the scope, you know, one notch here, downrange, you're yards off from target. It, it feels like if you get Adam wrong, it shifts the whole biblical narrative off kilter. So so could you maybe help us as you're you gave the the illustration of okay, here are these five points of you know the creation or you know uh, Adam garden creation. You know, walk through that those five steps for us. But could you tell us like maybe maybe where you see in that assessment? that there is that notch that's off because there was truth in what you said, but there was something that was off in different places. Could you maybe weigh in on some of that as well? Yeah, thank you. No, I love that uh, illustration of, of degrees that I think uh, errors often happen in degrees, right? And if you start, you know, I heard a pilot say once that if you calculate your, your, you know, your flight and you're going from, let's say, Dallas to uh, Chicago, and you're off one degree or two degrees, you probably will end up on the same airport or hair. But if you're going from Dallas to Australia to Sydney, you become shark food, right? So, I mean, th those small degrees will make a big difference the longer you go. And I think you're, you're spot on with that. And, and uh, yeah, I think uh, depending on how you, you, you know, what you compare this meta narrative with, but definitely I think anthropology, uh, the way they look at Adam and his position is an anthropology on steroids. And it's, it's exactly what you're saying. It's, it's blurring the distinction between the creator and creation. And I think that's, um, that's a problem within the whole word of faith meta narrative is that, that it exalts humans and at the same point lowers God at the, God's expense in a sense. But it also comes as a reaction maybe to Christian teachings which have not really seen human potential or humans, you know, the human's place in creation. 
So it's it's like that. You said it also very well. That it's a mix. It's both good and bad at the same time. And I usually say it this way: that if you if you have if you can imagine a you know a, 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 a line which is a truth line of zero, the word of faith hits higher than most uh, traditions and lower at the same time. That that's what makes it so difficult because there are some great stuff happening, uh, but also at the same time some really problematic issues which are getting quite dark. So it, it's it's that kind of mix. But yeah, I think you, you're putting a finger on something really important with the idea of Adam being created. Uh, it, it's uh, it's blurring the distinction between God and creation, which is a uh, a no-go zone. I mean, we, you know, Orthodox Christian theology has kept that line very holy. We don't we don't so cross it, that. It becomes creator so, creator, not creator creation. Do you right, see that yeah. if, if they have the if they if they have the same creation power that God the Creator has, then it's really God like creator creating creators rather than creator creating creation. <laughs> that that's very sense? fun yeah. tongue-tied yes we agree with you michael um yeah. can i can i ask okay so we have anthropology that gets us off kilter a little bit the way that we're defining faith gets us off a little bit because it's a faith in an outcome rather than a trust in a person that that gets us off kilter right it's like a psychological certainty of some kind so so that the faith uh anthropology um sowing and reaping you talked about this like contractual way of approaching the text of scripture. If you do this, I will do this kind of approach. And there certainly are, again, some biblical room for God saying, hey, if you do this, I will do this language, right? Yeah. So there's not, that's not inherently wrong, but could you show us maybe where that gets off kilter with some of the sowing and reaping stuff? Yeah, that's great. No, I mean, th again, I, coming back to my, my, my super good insight <laughs> that the word of faith raises great questions that theologians and, and we need to take seriously. While their own answers might be off, their questions might be really good. And one of those really good questions is that, is there, can we give with a expectation of reward? Is that wrong? And of course that, that rubbed scholars and theologians, you know, on the wrong side at the beginning, because they said, no, all giving should be, you know, you should not expect anything and so on. And then now scholars are saying, hey, if you study the New Testament, you find that Jesus emphasizes that we should give with expectancy and so on. So I think they are hitting some, some again, high notes there. But of course, there are some low notes in the same sentence sometimes. But yeah, sowing, sowing and reaping, uh, contractual relationship with God. I think this is very key within the word of faith worldview. And it comes back again to, to uh, Eden. I didn't bring it up in my short summary, but the idea is that God created the world through spiritual laws. And that the, the, the reason why the spoken word has power to create is a spiritual law. And another spiritual law is sowing and reaping in the word of faith story, right? So th these are spiritual laws that work and uh, they, they, a successful Christian life is about learning how to cooperate with these laws, how to tap into them and use them. So word of faith is, is very much into just the spiritual law paradigm that there are spiritual laws and they don't use it as an image you find paul using of course sowing and reaping and so on as an image as a metaphor for god's action in the world but in the hardcore word of faith what uh you know the hard you know those who follow the system in a sense or living out the meta narrative they uh, really put emphasis on that this are not just an image for how god works these are actual spiritual laws that our world, our life in this world is determined by, uh, you know, the law of gravity and our spiritual life is determined by these spiritual laws, the same way our physical life is determined. So if you want to be a success, you better learn these spiritual laws. So th th this is very, I I'll say bedrock into, you know, the word of faith, uh, belief system and worldview. So those, those two, those three things, I suppose, put in, in, into consideration. We, we lost authority, now we have authority. So we can do things. Because we have authority, we can do things with our faith, right? So our faith does things. And because there are these principles in the universe um, that I can, if I know the trick, I can, I can, just like the legal system, right? If I know the legal system today, I can actually work the legal system in such a way to like not pay very much taxes and to and to, to make the, the maximum amount of gross income that I can I can I can get my hands on, right? That that if I know how to work the system. So it, it seems as if 
you've got a person who, who has authority and because they have authority, they can exercise faith and because they can exercise faith and these, these universal principles and laws, can you maybe like explain to us how the word of faith works on grace? Like, you know, how, how this actually kind of robs so the doctrine of grace, because it seems like these are things that we deserve, the things that we've earned or things that maybe even Christ has earned for us. But, but now that's something that we have ontologically that we get to wield rather than being submitted, being dependent and depending on the grace of God and the power of God. Miller, it sounds like you had like maybe a follow-up question and or clarification well, for me. It, it, within their, their own uh, view of faith, the faith that they're talking about has parameters. And so they'll say that this is the same laws with which God works within. So at least that's my, my guess on this is that if you will abide by these principles within that, that, that fit within the framework of what they believe faith to be, then you get these kind of results, which at the end of the day is, is pragmatism, um, which, you know, if you'd ask the question, why is this so appealing in other places or and why has it made such a huge impact in most charismatic circles? It's because it's pragmatism. It gets results, right? So go ahead and, and fill us in. There. Yeah, no, great stuff. Well, yeah, uh, I think like we're saying, you're pointing at your finger to, or point, it's putting your finger on grace, which is a major issue. I mean, grace is is God's unmerited, unearned love and 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 power and working for us, right? So, uh, what happens with grace within this whole kind of paradigm of God now waiting on us to do something, and these gifts are, my, you know, and my my rights that I can just claim by faith, and it it really kind of turns faith, uh, grace a bit upside down in a sense. And I, I can just to share a story. I, I have a good friend. We went to Rama together. We were roommates. Uh, he, he's a pastor in Europe uh, and he was pastoring a word of faith-ish church for a number of years and, and they, you know, really preaching the word of faith message. And then he, he had a personal kind of burnout and uh, then, and really just a personal kind of uh, crisis moment. And he said to me that as he turned to God in prayer, he didn't find a merciful God on the other side of his prayers. That, that you know, a gracious God was not there. It was a God who said, use your faith. And, and not that it's a totally different God. I'm not saying that. I, I don't subscribe to that. I think this is still the Christian God. But, you know, the filter and the story we have put God into makes this God less gracious and less merciful uh, than the full biblical revelation of who God is in Jesus. So, yeah, so grace is a ma major issue here because the, the, the responsibility to act falls on us. But, of course, on the other side, that when we access these blessings or when through faith, right, then I get part of the credit as well, right? Because I, I use my faith. I, I really accomplished this. Like you're saying, it's pragmatic. It's instrumental. It, it, it gives me some kind of, uh, you know, way of shaping my future. And, and that's very, uh, you know, attractive. But yeah, so grace and the nature of God in this is somehow, you know, really, it's a disturbing image of God that comes out. And that touches again on... Say, on yeah. I was going to say, would you say that it turns faith into a work? Yeah, that's a good point. Uh, several people have kind of tried to lift that, you, you know, uh, and uh, in a sense, I, th I think that you can you, you can say it that way. Yeah. If uh, then, of course, the complexity that this is not all they say about faith. But yeah, if you just this part. Yeah, it's complex because you're saying they have multiple definitions of faith. So like yeah. when they're like saving faith, that's that's just trusting God. But, but where it's like faith that speaks things into existence, that's the faith of God, that's after you're in, that requires a level of psychological certainty. So it's like just that moving goalpost of working definitions. And anyone who's been in a charismatic movement for a long period of time, I mean, I remember my, my, my uh, well, I would take my daughter with us to uh, a Bible school classes in this, this charismatic school for a while. And when we were in this charismatic school, I mean, I'd have a, there would be a teacher that would contradict himself three times on stage. And just working with a, a flexible group of definitions where people can kind of just talk without being internally consistent and logically consistent with what they're saying uh, is something that just happens a lot in charismatic spaces. And that's not a dig. I think anyone who's been it in happens the a lot in for all a long spaces. time, it can happen in all spaces. Um, I'll tell you, 
having not been in those spaces for a while, I don't see it as much. Um, uh, yeah. Maybe that's just yeah, you and me both. <laughs> I think the fact is, though, I mean, when it comes to charismatic spaces in general, there is an inconsistency with how they define faith. And I think, uh, you know, he, he touched on this um, specifically the bit about faith in the word of God and what that means, because, again, it becomes another form of pragmatism where you have certain mechanical operations on how you apply the word of God to get the results that you're after in the same way you apply your declarations and confessions to get the things that you're confessing for. Yeah, yeah guys, yeah. we are at the point of the show. It's it's 580. It's 580. We're 58 minutes in. We try to wrap things up at, at uh, an hour mark. Uh, Mikael, I want you to come back on the show as long as you're you're willing to come on, man. I want to have you back on. This is a great yeah. conversation. I think there's we kind of just scratched the surface of what the worldview is. Maybe in our next program, we can kind of like dive into quotations and maybe even like breaking apart some of those Greek words that you're like, hey, I don't think that word actually means that. We probably shouldn't be using this text that way. Uh, I think it'd be fun to dive into some more of the nitty gritty with you if that's something you're interested in doing. Oh, absolutely. Uh, you know, this is my, my life. And again, I'm, I'm on the pursuit of a life of faith. So I find this very also spiritually helpful to kind of sort out this kind of stuff. So I would love to. Amen. Amen. So let's let's do that. But then also for people who are watching and they're like, I can't wait till the next time you get this guy booked. Mikael, where do people find your website? Where do they find their YouTube channel? Where do they find all the different content that you're putting out on this subject? Uh, your dissertation uh, is in book form. People can access it right now. How would they get their hands on that? Yeah, thank you. Well, so the easiest way is just type liberating.faith. That's uh, just our website. And if you go to Google or sorry, if you go to YouTube, you can write liberating faith or my name or something and you'll find some content there. Um, my, my thesis is published uh, right now. It's crazy expensive. Uh, it's called uh, the word of faith, the worldview of the word of faith movement, Eden redeemed, but it's coming in paperback, I think in May. And th that makes it a lot cheaper. So wait till May if you want it. That Josh, you still there? Sorry, I could not. My mouse was not responding. I'm so sorry. <laughs> <laughs> I just got the mic. I do this to you the did other to Michael, him to what Roundtree. you do to Roundtree. I just leave the camera on them until they feel uncomfortable. That was not intentional for you. I was just like, mouse isn't working. What's happening? That's okay. cool. Uh, anyway, uh, hey, thank you so much for coming on. I really appreciate it. And you. you guys, subscribe to the channel because I want uh, Mikael to come back on. I want you to get notified when he jumps back on the program because there's a lot to to. to you know, jump on with this subject. If you're watching right now, uh, you're watching live, I would encourage you to jump into the comment section and write question, uh, especially if you have a quote that you want us to engage with from a word of faith teacher or, or maybe a specific Bible verse that you're like, hey, uh, this seems like a word of faith linchpin for me. Why don't you go ahead and drop those comments into the comment section and maybe we take that comment and drop it into our next live video so that people can engage with that. So I, I would encourage you guys to do that because uh, I'd love to uh, engage with more of this content. Guys, thank you so much for tuning into this program. Uh, make sure to subscribe to the channel because we're coming out with content Mondays, Tuesdays, and Wednesdays from 4 to 5 p.m. Central Standard Time. Uh, lots of cool uh, opportunities coming down the pike. We have trips planned. Uh, can we can, can we say Anaheim Miller? Is that a can we, are we allowed to say that? It's kind of booked, right? I, yeah, I think it's pretty. I think it's a for sure thing, but we don't have a location for it yet. We don't know the exact times, but we do know okay. that the I guess the second weekend of August we're going to be in Anaheim doing a conference. So. Yeah, we'll get some that's vineyard guys out there in the Anaheim area that we're going to be doing some conferences with. So that's going to be fun. You guys need to go maybe check out some of that content. Uh, we've got conferences that we are planning to be at. We've got some stuff in Toronto that might happen. We've got stuff uh, kind of just sprinkled throughout the nation. So we'll kind of keep you guys up to date on some of that stuff. Uh, I say nation. <laughs> Toronto's not in our nation. Anyway, um, anyway, guys, thank it's you so much. Stay subscribed, training. like the video, and uh, we'll keep you notified on all that other great stuff that's coming out. So uh, we'll see you next time. Peace. Come on, Mouse, you can do it.